it sounds like things got harder for a while when you started CrossFit, when you made your diet, when you right. made changes to your diet. But in the end, despite that, you still think it's worth it. And you still are now seeing overall benefits. What are the biggest benefits that you've seen? Just how I feel. Mm-hmm. Sleep patterns are better. Mm-hmm. My mental mental attitude is night better. It's great to see it bleed out onto my relationships and my family and my kids are doing it. We started a CrossFit kids program at our gym. It's just getting pe- people to see like my parents was nice. They haven't quite gotten into it yet, but they've said, I've never seen every time I see you, like my wife and I, every time I see you to look healthier, you just look better. Hello and welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Dr. Julie Fouché, family physician and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring you information and inspiration to help bridge the gap between fitness and medicine and support your journey toward your healthiest self. This episode is one of a series of Pursuing Health stories where I feature the inspiring stories of regular everyday people who've used lifestyle to overcome some incredible health challenges. And in this week's episode, I share a conversation with Dr. Luke Palmasano. Luke was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at age 7, and almost 35 years later, he's an ER physician, an avid CrossFit athlete, a father, and a former collegiate wrestler. And along the way, he's learned quite a bit by modifying his lifestyle to help reduce the complications from this condition. We first met a couple years ago at the CrossFit Level 1 seminar for physicians, and ever since then, I've been struck by Luke's intensity and passion for using CrossFit to prevent and treat so many of the conditions he encounters daily as an ER physician. In this episode, we talk about how diabetes has impacted so many aspects of his life, how he's navigated the unique challenges of things like cutting weight for wrestling and beginning CrossFit with type 1 diabetes, what his experience in the emergency room has been like, especially in the midst of the COVID pandemic, and even how his service dog helps him to monitor his blood sugar. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Luke as much as I did. Before we dive into the episode, I do want to make it clear that this podcast is for general information only and does not provide medical advice. I recommend that you seek assistance from your personal physician for any health conditions or concerns. With that, let's get to the episode. Well, welcome to Pursuing Health. I am very excited to be here today with Luke Palmasano, who I had the pleasure of first meeting years ago at one of the CrossFit level ones that we did for doctors. Um, So Thank you for joining me. I'm really excited about all the different things we will get to dive in here in this conversation. Thanks for having me. I'm really honored. Um, So I thought we could start. I mean, one of the things I think that I first noticed when I met you was that you had your dog with you. (laughs) Yeah, right. Should I grab him? Baldwin, come here. here. Um, He's the the best. So Baldwin is a service animal for type 1 diabetics. Uh, um, I didn't know that existed before I met you. Yeah, you know, me neither. I've been type 1 diabetic for... 35 year, 34 years going on in 1987. I got diagnosed. Um, hey, come here. Just come say hi to everybody. Look, he doesn't want to get jumped on the court. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. So well behaved. There he is. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I've been diabetic since 1987. Got it when I was seven years old, which was interesting, you know, an interesting thing in and of itself. But so I had diabetic diabetes most of my young life, adult life, professional life. And I was just kind of sitting, scrolling through the internet one day and CNN had a big article about, you know, service animals for type one diabetes. It's like, what, what is this? And I, apparently they can smell. Now I've had bald in almost three years. Uh, so yeah, that over three years, right. That was when we first met, I pretty much just gotten them. Not, not long before that he can smell when my sugar gets above 200, almost he gets above 180 sometimes. Wow. You know, if he alerts me and it's 187, I definitely give him a treat. Um, wow and below 80. So, and he picks it up kind of like right away. He gets me 77, you know, 78, like in the (laughs) middle of the ER. And I'm just like, man, he can, now this, the hypoglycemia, I'm not a hundred percent what he smelled. I think it's the ketones, which always throws me off a little bit because the ketones I always assumed was DKA when you're in a different scenario, but then it made me realize just not to get too nerdy, but the DKA probably really messes with him because he smells both the high sugar and the ketones. And he's like, oh. those usually don't go together. Um, but I guess, on. yeah. So the ketones, my understanding is that he, when you, when your sugar's low and your body, do, I guess, stops having enough insulin in theory, it might have too much, but your body has to, there's not enough sugar around for the cells to suck in. So they have to figure out how to keep themselves going some other way. So they start 
producing ketones in the same way that they do during DKA when there's just no insulin around. Mm -hmm. That's kind of that's really incredible. Now, does it work for other people? Like if he's around someone else who's got low or high blood sugar, if you're working in the ER or something, will he alert you also? Yeah. Well, he did in the beginning and it's uh-huh. more just about the training. He kind of stops now. I, we joke around in the ER when there's somebody with the diabetic emergency close by, they're like, yeah, Baldwin's like, you're on your own, buddy. I don't get any treats. He doesn't get any treats. You know, it's all about the food. <laughs> all he cares about is eating. Um, so you know, when he alerts me, if he alerts, he alerts me, you know, it's all, it's really about me understanding what the alerts are. Mm-hmm. He alerts me like when he has to go to the bathroom and he alerts me when there's like a squirrel running outside yeah. and he alerts me all sorts of stuff, but he learns and I learn like which ones matter and don't. And I'm usually the one who gets it wrong, but he he'll alert. Yeah. So like I have to interpret the alerts. So he has to know that when he's trying to get my attention, he has to do it a certain way to get a treat when my sugar is. So if he's alerting me like, Hey, I got to go to the bathroom or, you know, the mailman's here, you know, he can't do the same alert. Like usually he puts both paws on me and jumps up. And if he does that and I immediately I go check and when it's not out of range, he gets ignored. So, yeah. you know, so most of the way. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Real, like what it turns into is, him alerting my wife for everything else <laughs> and <then laughs> him alerting me for the, the sugar, you know? So like when he has to go to the bathroom at like 6am, like he wakes her up. Which <laughs> totally fine. That worked out well for you then, I yeah. guess. <laughs> We're like, Hey, you know, he tells her when there's somebody outside and I'm just like, all right, unless it's like, you know, people we know that come to our door to ring the doorbell, then he just won't stop barking, even though his tail's wagging and it's people he knows. Yeah. So. He's interesting to have around. He's, so he's a very, very kind hearted dog. Yes. I've gotten to meet him a few times and he's so well behaved. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah. So tell us what it was like when you were first diagnosed with diabetes at age seven. So it's interesting. I'll give a little bit of a backstory. It may help. You know, we always just considered it my immune system going absolutely wild mm-hmm. and finally kind of homing in on type one diabetes, which is my mom was relieved when we got the diagnosis. So when I was a little kid, when I was, she tells me when I was one year old to two year old, when I got as a family physician, you're going to realize this is totally crazy, but I didn't gain an ounce. I was, didn't, wow. didn't grow at all, which is right. That's staggering. Scary. I saw that today. I'd be like, wow, that's nuts. Now this is like back in like 1981, right? So mm-hmm. 1981 to 1982, she was saying to the doctor, but he's not gaining weight. And he's like, oh, look at the tummy on him. <laughs> so then she decides to like, I was in Long Island, you know, New York, uh-huh. just let's go into Manhattan. Let's go to the children's hospital, children's clinic at Columbia. And the first doc, doctor walks in, the first thing he says is, how long has his stomach been distended? You know, uh, the t- yeah. doctor in Long Island is like, he's look at the tummy, you know, and it's like distended abdomen because I was just malnourished. I was yeah. allergic to mm. every, everything on the sun. It was crazy. I think my mom could count the things I could eat on one hand. She tells me like strawberry, really weird stuff, strawberries, egg yolks, rice flour, and might have been soy milk, so just just some random thing of just stuff. So she made what she could. Um, God bless her. She mm-hmm. kept me alive. It's a lot of. And then I was always kind of scary. Like, oh man! I can you imagine the new food to your kid. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, and having I mean having kids myself now, seeing them in distress and not knowing what to do is like got to be one of the hardest, yeah. hardest thing in the world. I mean, knock on wood. God bless. I have healthy kids. You know, they get bumps and bruises, but nothing major. Yeah. You know, they got the flu and we were like, ah, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, um, that, so that kind of like, she was able to get me out of that period to age, age two to seven. So like, I don't know, seven, I was always kind of a small, thin, little sickly kid. And then around the age of six to seven, it kind of like started to get a little more intense. We looked at the, you know, you in the grade school, you've got like your class pictures. Yeah. So it's funny to look at my like first grade, second grade, third grade class pictures. First grade is kind of like, all right, this is like a little kid, you know, mm-hmm. second grade is like, I was like, kind of like thin, like really? grayish color. Yeah. And then third, there I was plump and pink. And it, that was <laughs> between those two were the diagnosis, but diagnosis. I used to have to drink and pee like ungodly amounts. I, I mean, I, I think I, it's not to be too graphic, but I, I just, it's like my kidneys are working overtime. My creatinine's great. You know, my no microalbumin, my, I do well, but I don't know if I just unconsciously drink and so much fluids. Mm-hmm. I have a soda here, but um, 
but then, I mean, it was like crazy. I mean, we, I remember I used to cry all the time and my mom and bro- my brother would joke. They'd be like, okay, let me open up, get you a glass of juice. We're in the car, you know, there's obviously yeah. juice there. And um, I'd be like, but I'm so thirsty that we're going to be home in like 15 minutes. And I'd be crying. And then I remember one time, I'll never forget. We, there's like a 7-Eleven right before the turn off my street. And so we're like almost home, which is ridiculous. But I guess I was just badgering her so much. She pulls off into 7-Eleven to get me something. So she gets me something, probably just loaded with sugar. Who knows what it was. Yes. And I take it. I'm like, oh, 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 32 ounce, whatever. Seven year old girl drinks the whole thing. And I'm like, ah. And then I just say, I got to go to the bathroom. And my mom <laughs> freaked out. She had, she just <laughs> melted down in the, in the 7-Eleven like yelling at me but like not yelling at me just with concern like there is something wrong like you can't drink yeah. that thing and then immediately have to go to the bathroom <laughs> something is wrong we are going to the doctor I'm just like I just gotta pee you know like, <laughs> like I'm just thirsty and I gotta pee. yeah <laughs> obviously as a physician now yeah. with my you know hindsight it's like well obviously that was yeah. what was yeah. going on but so yeah but I ne- never not once in my life was I in DK and I always I always hold that as a banner that is know, but, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's um, really rare. which yeah, blows my mind. Some of these, I mean, there's a whole lot of social stuff that's tough. Thank you know, thank God that I was. My dad had a city job. We had great health insurance. Mm-hmm. I grew up in the days before the pharmaceutical companies decided to gouge everybody for insulin, which is mm-hmm. it's astronomical how much they charge. I mean, thank God my wife has a great job with the county of Los Angeles, mm-hmm. um, so we get great health insurance. And she really, I mean, it's the county's an interesting place. She she's such a she's, got a lot of advanced degrees. She's a CNS. She's got a master's degree in, uh, in education. I mean, she's one of the more advanced practice nurses out there, but she stays there with it really for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I give her a lot of credit for, I mean, she, she went and made her way back to the ER with this advanced degree and she's having a great time now, but, but she did some jobs in the County that she was just like, this is, this is tough because I can't really use any of my skills and, but, but we really needed it. So Mm-hmm. I grew up in the day. I was lucky that I, you know, insulin. I remember all the crazy uh, things that would come out. So I started in my diabetic journey with, you'd have to prick your finger and the glob of blood that you would need was like a wow. monster. It was huge. Thank God I was a little kid, right? So you drop this monster glob of blood on the strip. You'd wait 60 seconds. Oh. It's like a long, kind of a long time, right? Yeah. And there was no digital things on there. So you'd have to like time it wipe the strip off, wait another like 120 seconds and then stick the strip in the machine. And it would count down like 30 seconds to give you the number. So it was like a five to 10 minute ordeal to do this. And I took pork insulin. It was pure pork insulin. I remember they had beef insulin, didn't work quite as good. Pure pork was the better one. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, I think 92 when genetic recombinant technology came out uh, and down the street from me in Cold Spring Harbor Labs in New Long Island, I remember how what a big deal that was. And the first thing they made was insulin, human insulin and humulin, which was like not pure pork anymore. It was human insulin. And it was like, I remember that. The, that it, it was way better. Yeah. And then the last decade has been a roller coaster of CGM and pump and all sorts of stuff. And I don't know, maybe I'm just old school at heart. My body just rejects all of them. Really? I love the technology. My just skin gets so, you know, probably with CrossFit and sweating oh, and they, they're supposed to stay on your body for 14 days, like four days later, my skin starts itching and, and it just peels off. I just like can't nothing. handle any of them <laughs> on my four fingers or like, I should, if you can see them, they're like yeah. little, little dots on them. Pricked so many times. What was it like for you kind of growing up and figuring out? Um, I mean, as a kid, it's hard enough at, you know, growing up as it is, but what was it like? navigating the type one diabetes for you? It, it was, I mean, like I, getting it at seven is a great age to get it. You know, if I were 13, that'd be tough, right? Yeah. If I were 19, that'd be tough. Going through the maturity of trying to be cool and popular and fit in with different crowds or whatever it is that you're doing as a kid that causes you so much stress. Nowadays, it's a million times more with social media, but really? having this thing that you have to always have on your mind, like it's, it's like, I took the master's course recently, which is awesome from CrossFit. And oh, that's um, great. I remember the picture and I always use the same analogy with my days as a diabetic. It was like the picture of the steps, right? You got like three steps for a regular person to go from a 
pull up to a kipping pull up to whatever. Yeah. But, but the, you know, the older folks, you got to kind of like have little tiny little more exactly. steps to get yeah. them up there much quicker. And it's, I feel like that's my day is way more like that than most normal people is every hour has these, it's like a graphics equalizer, but normal graphic equalizer has like 16 of those things. And mine's got like 115 billion, you know? Yeah. What are the different, what's the carbohydrate content? Yeah. Where am I in my day? What's my circadian rhythm? What's my, how adrenergic am I? How's my stress level? How much sleep did I get? Throw into it. What type of workout am I doing today? Um, I work on night shifts, which is even crazier. So during the day as an adult now, it's probably a lot more intense. But so as a kid, it's like you got that little bit every day, right? Seven years old, eight years old. I'm trying to figure it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're a seven, you're seven year old. Like you're so, right. you're so plastic. The, the, the plasticity of the brain and the spirit to be able to just took it on. And it was like, I, I almost say like, if it didn't come with like the side effects of what diabetes, diabetes could do to me later down the road, I try and keep myself as healthy as I can. Mm-hmm. I'd still get rid of it at any moment if I could. But the benefits I get, I see kids that get it new onset all the time. Type ones in particular, type twos is a little different mm-hmm. uh, with the degree of change you're forced to do immediately, right? Type two, you can, you can run on type two without changing a lick of your lifestyle. And you probably won't really notice any difference for years, decades, sometimes Mm -hmm. Um, type one, you, you ignore it for 12 hours. You're like, you're going to know about it very quickly. So it's, you're forced. You're really like, you're beaten into submission with knowing, like, if I eat that whole pile of Skittles, Mm -hmm. I will pay for it no matter what, whether it's my mouth is dry, I'm, I'm, my muscles are cramping and I can't stop going to the bathroom or the other, you know, whatever it is, some, you know, some people get other, you know, Mm -hmm. once you get side effects and stuff. So it was a little easier as a kid, I think, to just learn it and get it. And then maybe, or maybe in half of that might've been just me always into, you know, nutrition. I didn't get into athletics later because I was so small. So football, Mm -hmm. basketball, that stuff was never really good for me, but I eventually found wrestling, which, you know, third place in the ACC um, my senior year in 2002 at Duke. Mm -hmm. I was at a decent wrestler in high school got you know got recruited to go in ncaa d1 and then crossfit is very similar competitive so i, I was really mm-hmm. gracious to go through that but what was um interesting for me was the foundation in nutrition that i basically had to teach myself from diabetes and I, I had some guidance from the physicians like learn i remember being in the hospital at age seven learning the difference between a starch and a carbohydrate and okay. sugar mm-hmm. that they were all similar because i'm like i thought I give insulin for sugar and like, well, yeah, but you also give it for carbohydrates. And then people were using this term starches. I'm like, well, wait a minute. What are, and, and, but I wanted to know, and I learned the difference between those three things, which is a difficult thing to a lot of people to understand, I'm trying to explain it in the ER to patients about cutting down on the starches. I have that poster yeah. on an eight by 10 black and white in my ER and I give it out. And when I have to explain to people what starches are, maybe you can help me. I'm still trying to get across the, uh, headquarters to try and get that in Spanish. <laughs> oh, that's a great idea. I have them in frames, but they yeah. won't allow me to hang them in my ER unless they're in Spanish too. So I'm trying to find a way to get that. I, they will allow me to plaster them in the walls of our waiting room and stuff. I just, they can't, anything we hang has to have be in Spanish. Also. Spanish also. Oh, that's great feedback. Yeah. Um, that's great. What was it like with wrestling? Cause I imagine with wrestling, there's so much that goes into nutrition and cutting weight. And I imagine throwing the diabetes in there would be really, yeah, it, <laughs> really challenging. Yeah. That actually has a couple of interesting points there. So the, the first one was, so nutrition was hysterical. So I remember in NCAA division one, I, I started in 98 mm-hmm. college. So I don't know if you remember, there were a couple of deaths, two deaths of kids mm-hmm. cutting weight in mm-hmm. college. They used to, used to weigh in the night before and then wrestle the next day. And so you'd be, incentivized to cut this monstrous amount of weight. You have like 12 hours to rehydrate and refuel and you know, it almost be a different person. Mm-hmm. They changed that my freshman year instantly when these young folks died, unfortunately, um, to weigh in an hour before. Mm-hmm. And it took a few years for people to really realize that it. it took me about three years to realize that you can't cut weight and then replenish in an hour. You just mm-hmm. can't cut weight. But mm-hmm. throughout my whole high school and wrestling career, junior high, was, you know, I didn't really start cutting weight till high school, but that, you mean, it, that was kind of the idea. Most of it in high school too, is the hour before. So you really can't. And I wish if any wrestlers, young wrestlers are listening, don't cut weight, just don't do it. 
lean, get your body lean. So lean mass over your, over your training, have good nutrition. Don't cut weight. Now, if you want to like put on a rubber suit and, you know, drop three, four pounds of whatever, that's, that's really easy. That's just like wringing out a towel. But, but this man, at times, I think I dropped like 17 pounds, 15, wow. 12. It's just, that's just not healthy that back up and down yo-yo and you're going to not, your performance is going to suffer. Um, throwing diabetes in the mix was, was impossible. In fact, that the only way to do it without really having any danger was, and this is obviously dangerous, be hyperglycemic, just run high. Hmm. You pee up, you, you diaries yourself, you lose some weight and you just, your sugars are number high. You don't have to worry about because hypoglycemia was such a danger because you have to eat something. Right. And then you're like trying to lose weight. Like we're talking ounces and 0.1 of a pound and a little cup of pee hmm. or whatever. Like that's what that's, that's, you want to go in the negative direction. So to have to put anything in would be such a danger. So my sugars got high. And then it got so bad that my junior year in college, I was wrestling 133 for the first three years. I was in the starting lineup and I was pretty well ranked in the ACC. And I just, I was in the hospital. I, I think it was for sepsis. It was terrible. I, yeah. I had a cauliflower ear. So my ear in a college used to stick out straight. You, I don't know if you've ever noticed it. You can probably see it if we're in person. It's like, I don't have that kind of concha and contour. It's just yeah. kind of flat, mm-hmm. but it used to be out like this, but it was always fresh. So as I mean, it's, it's probably terrible, but as a diabetic and a wrestler and a pre-med, you know, I used to drain everybody's ear with my insulin syringes on our team sure. and my own. So I stick my insulin syringe out, stick it out, you know, obviously we use a fresh one for everybody, but <laughs> I guess I did it too often on my own and this thing got infected. So I got an abscess in there. Oh, geez. I bit my tongue. I got an abscess in my tongue, which is like, I don't know how that happens, but when your sugar is 500, I guess anything can happen. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I got like, like a zoster across my face. Okay. Um, it was terrible. So I was in the hospital for a week at Duke right during the Christmas break, oh. which was finally, I was just like, you know, I said to my coach, I'm like, you know what? Like I'm not cutting weight anymore. I'm going to just take the rest of the half of the season off and come back next year. And I wrestled 149 my senior year. And lo and behold, I took third in the ACC, um, did the best I had done yet. And, uh, realize I would be, I'd be wrestling these monsters. Right. And they didn't get it yet. That like, if you don't cut weight and you're just like, I weighed about 150 pounds. So I would make go 149. I was trying to make 133 weighing 150, which was crazy. I wrestled wrestling 149. I was wrestling these monster sized guys, but then the third period, I could hear them like, <laughs> you know, like breathing and, um, which is easily to easy to win. So it really was just like, don't, um, don't cut weight. But what's funny too, I remember all of one other thing is that when I was a freshman, so with this thing of like, okay, now you must weigh in an hour before one of these impl- in- things, uh, NCAA instituted was a mandatory nutrition course mm-hmm. for wrestlers. Mm-hmm. You got to like, understand like, Hey, this is, this is what your fuel is. And I don't know why they don't do this for all athletes. Right. Um, but nobody knew anything about anything. The lady kept being like, she thought she's like, all right, well, what's how many calories per gram and a gram of protein? I'm like four, you know, and she's like, anybody, you know, protein, <laughs> you know, four carbohydrates, uh, nine fat. And she's like, all right. And she, she was trying to like get me. And I was the only one. She's like, how many calories per gram and a gram of alcohol? I'm like seven. And she's <laughs> like, you are the only athlete in the entire country. I've been going around doing this course. You're the only one that knew how many calories per gram and a gram of alcohol, wow. which is something most people don't know. Right. I mean, just a pure vodka that's got calories in it, you know, but uh, yeah. So I, that was just knowing all that stuff growing up it was four calories, four calories. So there's more in fat and, you know, the different stuff was, um, I thought it was a great, you know, laid a great foundation. For- totally. And totally. Yeah. eye opening, And it's such a great lesson, I think to apply in a lot of situations about not necessarily trying to take changing shortcuts, but doing things in the right way usually will end up with the best result. Like, like trying, making sure that your body's healthy and it has what it needs. It's going to perform better. It makes logical sense, but I'm sure in that culture of wrestling, it's probably hard to to see that when you're in the middle of it. Oh yeah. I mean, I remember when we first met on my L1 course, I'm like, I feel like I'm home. All this <laughs> stuff that they're saying is stuff that I feel like I've kind of came to the same conclusions, maybe from the school of hard knocks, but basically what we're both saying right now, right. Is mechanics consistently consistency, intensity, right. It's basically yeah. start with the foundation 
add on, go in your slow step. And when, when each step is done, move, do it the right way. And it's, you know, it's funny. I wish people could take it CrossFit as a metaphor for life. <laughs> it really is. It really is. You can apply it everywhere. It, the hyperglycemics I saw with the sugars of 700, I'd be loading them up with insulin and fluid, but get discharged. I'm like, this is before I was across, knew anything about CrossFit. I'm like, for the next seven days, you can eat nothing but meat and vegetables and water. That's what I would say. I said that to patients for years. And then I come here and I see that and I'm like, oh my God, this is way better than when I came up with it. <laughs> I'm going to get this poster. That's <laughs> great. How did, so how did you end up deciding to go into medicine? I think I kind of knew my whole life. Mm-hmm. And so my I had an Italian overprotective mom, who's the best, but so I went to see every type of specialist. If there was a specialist, I saw him, mm-hmm. I saw an exercise physiologist physician, probably, I don't know if they were PMRT. And I was like, as a kid, I was like, oh, this is cool. You know, like you can do yeah. that. endocrinology. I already knows I saw an ENT. I mean, I saw everybody and I would always just kind of mess with the equipment and see the little like sculptures they had in their office and kind of, yeah. I took a liking to it. Um, so I kind of knew from my time I was a kid, like, I think I want to be a doctor just mm-hmm. so I, but, but that freed me up to do a lot of other stuff. So I remember when I got to med school, but got to college and they were like, everybody thinks they need to be a bio major mm-hmm. pre-med, but the pre-med person too was like, no, no, major in what you like. So my mom and whole mom's side of the family were artists. My grandpa was a photographer and a furniture maker and my mom does wall finishing. So I was a visual art major and I felt that that was probably the, one of the most helpful things for being at least an emergency physician, it's the procedural component and the surgical component Mm -hmm. of medicine is so, it's so important to be able to have an athletic kind of hand-eye coordination. Now I was never a good basketball player, but as far as like threading a catheter, using an ultrasound, getting a shoulder reduction, that kind of stuff. I mean, most of my colleagues will come to me in the ER when they're having trouble with the procedure you know, the, just the little, little things to do with your hands yeah. that I think sculpture was really the one that kind of mm-hmm. really did it, get a wound approximated the right way on how many, don't be shy away from different layers and mm-hmm. use different angles of your throws for the different layers to kind of, to get the wound to kind of, to appear the way you want it. That's so cool. Did you know right away that you wanted to go into ER or how did you decide that? Oh no. yeah, no, I thought I was, I was a typical athlete. So I thought I wanted to go into orthopedic surgery. Yeah. Um, and that has I got there. artistry to it as well. No, absolutely. I, I thought it was great. But then I realized the more I, when I got to med school and that I thought it was just because I had so much going on as an undergrad, like my ADD really kind of flared out. <laughs> and I, was, I just watched the surgical subspecialties and the surgeons and the surgical culture was just like, man, it's so monotonous and it's, they beat you down. Now you can break out of that. If I thought like if I ever was forced to do a surgical residency, mm-hmm. absolutely for sure I would do trauma mm-hmm. critical care as a surgeon. Cause that's kind of like, you don't know what you're going to get. And it's always kind of fun, but, but it's still a, a very drawn out slow. They do their 24 hour call and they round and they, mm-hmm. whereas I, it's just like, it's like the fast and the furious in the ER, you know, you're like, you put the car in like fifth gear in reverse. Right. And then they drop the hatch and then you hit the ground, like mm-hmm. 90 yeah. miles an hour. <laughs> so that, I think I, that was part of it, but I'll never forget. Like the, I got exposed to it. I, so I grew up in Long Island, went to college in North Carolina, and then I got into USC like two weeks before the classes started, okay. which is kind of a funny story in of itself. So the lady who let me in, Dr. Erin Quinn, she was in the head of the admissions office at the time. She gave me a call and playing softball. And then I don't see her again for like, you know, 20 more years after I leave graduate med school or 10 years, right. after 15 years. Turns out her grandson is best friends with my son at their elementary school. No way. They're, yeah. They're like best friends for years. And I'm talking to like <laughs> kids, dad and mom were hanging out one day, like years after their friends. And I'm like, she's like, Oh, you went to, where'd you go to med school? I'm like, oh, I went to USC. She's like, Oh, you, did you know my mom? My mom was there. I'm like, Oh, who's your mom? She's like, oh, Aaron Quinn. I'm like, your mom, like let me into med school. Like I'm, we know we see each other all the time. I'm like, I always tell my kids, I'm like, our whole lives are, or, or, you know, we owe to this lady here. So be nice here. But, um, yeah. So I got in there and then they offered USC run, used to run this course called USC essentials. Okay. Now it's broke off from USC. It's just called the essentials of emergency medicine, but it's the biggest U- ER conference outside of ASAP every year. It's got to be this monster thing, but the first year they, they launched it. I was a first year med student. They said, does anybody want to come? We'll comp your entry and you can grab a ride from any of the second year med students. 
So I was like, I've never been to Vegas. I just moved out to California. Like I'll, I'll go check it out. Yeah. And I'll never forget. I was blown away by like, I could sit there as a brand new first year med student, listen to all these fairly intense critical care, intense lectures. And it was like, I understood everything about what they're doing, like simple stuff, like airway, breathing, circulation, like stabilized fractures, stop bleeding. Mm -hmm. I remember there's this guy, Lance Brown. He's like one of the heads of uh, pediatric emergency medicine is the specialty. He's based out of uh, Loma Linda, I think out in uh, Eastern California, but he comes up there and he's like, this is how you do, you assess a pediatric trauma patient. And it's just like, it's this kind of roly poly guy who comes in there and there's this kid like crying, you know, in a seat collar and a poo. He's like, man, he's like, you know, pop, beep, boop, pop, you know, like starts tickling him. And I'm like, I can do that. Like, <laughs> obviously, look, and then you see the kid kind of laugh and giggling, move his hands yeah. and close his hands, like symmetrical cervical spine, you know, like all this stuff, like with arrows on the screen. I'm like, I can, yeah. I can do that. It's like fun. Yeah. Oh. And then from there, I yeah, it just kind of took off. That's cool. What has it been like for you, especially these past couple of years as we've gone through, you know, we're still in, but the COVID pandemic and everything else. Yeah, that was, in, that, yeah. I mean, everybody has kind of their own different take and how it happened, but LA was very strict on everything from the beginning, which I think slowed it. We were mm -hmm. from the beginning, we didn't, we were expecting this tidal wave. And I think what we all forget is a tidal wave is not this picture mm -hmm. like we see, right? A tidal wave, like if you see the tsunamis of the recent, like the actual real tsunamis, mm -hmm. they're just slow, steady, progressive tide change, right? Mm -hmm. It's just water coming up from your feet. It's not, it's not a big wave coming down and crashing on you, which most people think of as a tidal wave. Mm -hmm. A tsunami is just the, the tide comes in and it comes in fast and it slowly rises before you know it, an hour later, you're underwater. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of what it was here, but real slow. We caught it for a couple months and then right around this time last year was when the steady streamed. It's like every pay, every shift, it wasn't like New York where it was like this wave that crashed where all of a sudden nobody knew what was going on. I mean, they didn't, it was before everything in New York, right? So they were all passing it to each other without masks on, not understanding, you know, wearing garbage bags and stuff just because they didn't, nobody knew what the heck was going on. But we luckily were a little ahead of the curve in LA or not ahead of the curve. We just, we didn't get hit yet. Not the news. So by the time we got it, it was, we knew what we were doing and we were able to slow it. So for me, it was like once one or two patients to shift, I would admit mm -hmm. with COVID pneumonia and hypoxia, every once in a while, I'd intubate one of them, mm -hmm. um, put them on BiPAP or something, but it was a slow steady for each of us. But the problem was each one of these patients you admit to the hospital was sticking around for three weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, if they got admitted with hypoxia on day five or day two, three, they're going to get worse and they're going to, and a lot of them got admitted and debated upstairs. We had this expanded ICU over three floors. Our poor ICU docs were, it wasn't as hard for us in the ER. You know what I mean? It was way harder upstairs. I was, and then um, December of last year, my family and I all got COVID, which mm -hmm. was kind of terrible, but we, we were all okay. We all stayed home. We had the flu. We got, I guess at that point we got Bamlanivimab, which was the some diabetic and okay. the monoclonal antibody. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife has some thyroid issues. So, we both kind of qualified for it. My kids had COVID and got, did fine, but it was interesting. My wife was the first one who got sick and started feeling really bad. She had this terrible pleurisy in her back here. Every time she took a breath and I'm like, oh, I wonder if you're developing like a pneumonia. So when we went in, she was on like day three, I was on day one. Actually, that was the day I got tested. I had a fever that morning. So I figured okay. I was going to be positive. But when she got the infusion, she was like, I feel this really weird tingling at the exact same spot where she had um, symptoms. So I'm sure it was, it worked, but so we didn't really get sick, but I was out of the ER now for, we we're supposed to go to New York for the holidays. So we didn't do that. I already had the time off and then I was out for two weeks. So I had almost a month of sitting at home. So it was like, not super hard for me, but I had to do these meetings and very moribund every day. Um, it got critical. Like not that we, we, didn't, we were a disaster center. So we had more than enough ventilators. We had this stockpile of ventilators that were like, one for five people with the same settings. I don't know. These are all kind of disaster stuff. I don't know if you've ever heard of those. They're like, they're all separate circuits, but if you have, you have to have the same pressure and the same rates and the same. So if you could find five people with the same typical vent settings, they wouldn't be sharing a circuit, but they would be on the same machine. Mm -hmm. We never had even had to use them. We, we had a way enough ventilators, but what we didn't have was enough dialysis units. Mm -hmm. So we were on these calls every day about like, who are we going to not offer dialysis to? We had to rank the patients. Now, 
it sounds terrible, right? And it was, it was just the idea of it was kind of messed up, but at the end of the day, it wasn't, it was just tough because it was like, all right, well, the top five on the list are people that have no family that are from nursing homes that came in, they were already on a ventilator. They were already on a feeding tube. Mm -hmm. They, their prognosis was already kind of terminal. So the decision wasn't super hard. It was like, well, the young, healthy person gets admitted. The person we're not going to offer dialysis to is the person that's basically at the end of their life anyway. But that's just kind of a tough, tough. ethical that's thing to tough. get into, you know? Yeah. So we had to do that like daily. Luckily, we never actually had to make any of those decisions. The person either was getting dialysis and then just died, or um, uh, we just, we freed up machines from around the area. We were able to trade them and get them. And so things seemed to work themselves out kind of to a kind of very sad state at <laughs> the middle of January, we had just a high mortality where just this bunch of people just kind of died in the hospital freed up. We were like, what happened? Everything's much easier. We're getting beds, people are going upstairs. And it was just like, like 10% of the population or 4% or something. It was like a big chunk of our admitted COVID chronic patients all just kind of died around the same time. And it was just yeah. like, it just freed everything up. And then since then we haven't really been stressed as a healthcare system. So I can see how bad it can get. You know, all this stuff is just, it's so sad how political can get be just because of social media and people with this misinformation, all stuff ideas out there. But, you know, it's always just like, you got to make sure that you're in the middle of the, like one of these old ER physicians that taught me, this guy, Billy Mallon is super smart. He used to say, just stay in the herd. You know what I mean? Don't go venture too far outside the herd. But right now we have like these people that are way outside the herd and they're pulling people out of the herd to go on either sides of it. And it's just like, just stay in the herd, you know, like you don't have to be so intense on any direction. You know, I don't really want to get into like, I feel bad for the people that are not like, wanting to vaccinate and the people that don't want to vaccinate, they're getting made to do it. It's just like, it's tough. The police and the firemen, I feel bad for they're in a bad situation. The nurses though, I, I kind of like, it's kind of sad, right? I don't know where your, where your hospitals at. Do they have to do PPDs every year? Part of your health clearance? Um, well, I'm right now I'm not at a hospital, but where I was, yeah, we had to yeah, do that. Every year, right? Stick a needle in your arm, put a little, jab a little bit of something into it read it 48 hours later. That's been part of our lives for the past decades. Mm -hmm. Some of these nurses are like, I don't, my freedom. I don't want to get something stuck in my arm. I'm like, this is part of the responsibility of working in a hospital. Now, firemen and the police that don't have to do that, like this is new to them. I can kind of give them a lot more like, all right, you guys, this is new to you. Let's, let's warm you up and get you into it. But for the nurses at our hospitals that are like, I'm leaving, I'm not getting a vaccine. It's just like, well, Mm -hmm. Did you get this thing stuck in your arm every year? Like just take out COVID vaccine and substitute PPD. And if you feel that strongly about it, sure. Your, your, your opinions are valid, but why didn't you feel that strongly about P your PPD last year? Like it doesn't make any sense to me, but. Yeah, it's a tough, it's a, just a tough issue all around, but. Um, what about, um, I want to talk about CrossFit more too, because we haven't even gotten there, but oh, yeah, right. when did you actually, how did you actually find CrossFit? Um, funny enough. So when I first moved to LA, I saw it and this is like back in like the Oh four Oh five. And I guess I'm kind of really yeah. glad I came into it, but I didn't, I didn't get, I didn't start doing it. Cause I was just like, I think maybe I just, I had, I'd been lifting weights and probably not in the proper way, but for most of my life, you know, I was just kind of like a bench press guy that used to go to the yeah. gym all the time. And I just kind of, now that I didn't have to have to do it for wrestling and I was free, I went into a kind of a more of a long distance Okay. Uh, for a while there, I was doing, um, I did seven mar LA marathons. I did I think eight of the Malibu triathlons oh. and enjoyed it. But I'll tell you, my health wasn't anywhere near as good huh. as when I started CrossFit and something about that mental, I think that's why it helps the old folks so much is that just a little bit of competition, you know, okay. like my kids at school, everybody's like, you, you know, the, the whole anti-bullying thing, which is obviously very important, but if you take the coin and the, the bad side is bullying mm -hmm. the goods. There is a good side of peer pressure, like mm -hmm. peer pressure in a good way. I mm -hmm. remember when my kids were in like um, preschool, they're home in their high chairs, like throwing food around, smashing up. I'm like, God, my kids are going to be like these little, <laughs> like these little animals that just don't know how to use utensils. And they still don't, we still eat at home and they pick up their steak with their hand <laughs> and then they pick up their broccoli with their hand. And I'm just like, <laughs> friends come over you're at your friend's house please just use your fork you know like yeah, I, whatever yeah. we're gonna do but i go to watch them in preschool behind the like the two-way mirror or whatever and there they are opening up dainty their napkin with their fork <laughs> and their knife and i'm like 
who are these kids? It's because their friends are there, right? They both potty trained before they were two years old. So saw the older kids in their class going to use the potty. They're like, I don't want to be the old kid who's pooping his pants, you know? And it's like, you know, a little bit of good peer pressure. So that's what that competition, I think, is is, is one of those good things for it. Totally. Um, and- it can be a really positive thing. Like, I think most of the time when I go to a class in, a, in an affiliate, I get way more out of my workout than I would if I was by myself. But it can certainly be taken to an extreme where it could become a negative thing like anything else. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, and it usually comes from yourself, right? I mean, exactly, yeah. I tore two quads in three months. Oh, boy. This isn't that long ago. The second one was like a month and a half ago. So I'm still kind of rehabbing, but it's just like, you want to, so the first one I was doing that HWPO program, which I thought was great. It was intense. It was a lot of working out. You know what I mean? That would be intense if it's from Matt Frazier. <laughs> right. But it was like, I was in the gym for two and a half hours some days. And I'm like, this is, I had to split them up into two days, you know, like okay. still an hour each over an hour each. Yeah. But one of them was like an 86% of your one rep max to a 95% of your one rep max. And after I just been beating my body down for a few months, um, I think it was too big of a jump for me. I just went down and just pow, my right fastest lateral. I felt it. I knew immediately what it was. Pow, boom. And I got an MRI and sure enough, it was, so I rehabbed it three months later and I thought I was good. I had three months, you know, it's kind of easing my way in, probably not easing it in as much as I thought. And I was warming up for the lift, lift move work mm-hmm. competition. Because my other buddy who's a trauma surgeon in Denver, this guy Jeff Anderson, texted me a score. And there's years like that, that yeah, like competition. That competition, you know, um, it comes in and is like, oh, this is how many things. I'm like, I know I can do more than that, you know. <laughs> but that one rep max, you know, I was, I was not three months after a quad tear is not the time to one rep max to squat clean. I was warming up, you know, I did 135, 155, bunch of them, 175 a few times. I felt good. I just threw 185, which isn't heavy for me. Yeah. And as soon as the bottom of the squat, my left one, pow, I just yeah. dropped it and laid on the floor. I'm like, what is wrong? So now for the next year, I'm going to just turn that voice off of the, you know, the inner one. That's like, you can do it, you know, which is what some people struggle with. Right. But you're right. It can, you can go over the curve on that one and and hurt yourself. But, but I didn't start doing CrossFit until officially I wanted to do it for years. Right. So in 2010, I'm like, God, I should be doing this, you know, and I think just kept getting in the way, you know, never I had the fire until I went to the gala of my hospital. And I think it says 2016 and my friend started into it and he was telling me about it. And I'm like, I'm like the last person in the world that's going to do this and I should be doing it. Um, but I'm going to do it now that you're doing it. But he's yeah. like, so then at, in the end of in the middle of October, or November, we had our gala and his gym, which is I think horsepower. Maybe you heard about them. They had that lawsuit in Manhattan beach. That was like terrible. Where then neighbors were yelling, they were dropping weights. I don't know. It was terrible, okay. but, but they, um, they donated a three month membership for auction. Okay. I guess all these physicians were like drinking too much wine and not really into working out. Nobody bid on it. So like by the end of the night, I think I like, I, I jumped on, I'm like, nobody bid on this thing. I'm buying it. It's like, oh, I got it for like 45 bucks. It was awesome. So all right. yeah. And then they say I had a branch in studio city, which isn't too far from me. I'm near downtown, but okay. I was driving up there and going and it was like, I was like, this is great. You know, you would vomit if you saw my snatch at the time. It was, <laughs> I've never, never done that thing before. It Everybody looks so bad. I look like a starfish, you know, like my feet were like super far and it was, um, not that it's really good now at all either. My daughter's is way better than mine. I mean, she's eight and she nails a squat snatch. We have that little five pound rogue bar. It's like, she's so, so good at it. That's adorable. But I, uh, but yeah, so then I started then and then so but my wife saw, so when I bid on it, we went to the gala and my friend who worked with me, his wife was there and her arms were just shredded. <laughs> and my wife is like, how did you get arms like that? She's like, oh, I've been doing CrossFit now for a couple months. My wife's like, I'm doing it. And I'm like, I go on there and I buy mine. I'm like, all right, well, you're kind of on your own, you know? Yeah. She's like, oh, so, so she started at our current gym, CrossFit Echo Park, before okay. I did. So I was driving up to Studio City. She was going to our local box that I'm at now. Okay. And so we both started kind of around 2016. So. That's so cool. And how has that, how has, has it at all impacted the rest of your life, like your diet or your type one diabetes and anyway. everything. Yeah. Everything. I got, I don't, I don't even know where to begin. Um, the first thing I noticed, cause I'd been involved in heavy, intense exercise before this was obviously a bit different. I would say more intense probably because it was shorter. It was a great awakening that like, you don't have to work out for 30 minutes straight every day. Like 
because I was doing these like five mile runs or like, you know, I'd lift, but I just do more stuff because it wasn't like, I never thought that you could work out for four minutes and five seconds or whatever my best friend time was, you know, and be like, that's, that's good for the day. You know, who knew, but, um, the first big thing that it really smacked me in the face was we did one of this typical nutrition challenges. This is before I really knew anything much about mm-hmm. don't eat a lot of starch. Cause our, our gym is not very um, into the whole, you know, they, they are, they are, but they're very quiet about it. They're not in your face about like um, you stop eating sugar and stuff. But my wife walked in there with diet Pepsi one time and everybody was like, what are you doing? And she's like, <laughs> I was this bad, you know, I didn't even know positive peer pressure. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Absolutely. But we did a nutrition challenge and man, that started a rocky year for me in diabetes wise, because so instantly my basal cut in half. So my Atlantis dropped my, you know, that was a cost saver, right? So that's yeah. expensive stuff. So that was kind of interesting. But then my hypoglycemia was intense there for a little bit. Um, I think I had to get the fireman called on me once or twice. Mm. My wife used glucagon half a dozen times in the morning. Just, yeah. I would just have these ranges of the days I wasn't working nights and when the things would kick in and those, 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 those swells, the bottom of them would get to a critical point where I was like, you know, my sugars were like 20 or 30, um, which I would have when I'm awake. If I'm, if I had my sugar dropped to 30 right now, I might, start acting a little funny or maybe I drop a couple F bombs or something, or maybe I'd even get in the ER. I get irritated like yeah. with lack of perfection, which you could imagine in the ER is like quite frequent. So yeah. if you're, if you're a perfectionist, it's not a really good place to be. <laughs> but, um, so the nurses know, like, you go check your sugar and now ball them will let me know before it's even coming. But, yeah. um, yeah. So, but, but while I'm sleeping, that's the only times I really have a problem. So when I try and wake up and, mm-hmm. So that was about a year of rockiness until we finally, like, I I had to change, like, internally, like, when I'm this high or I'm feeling like this, this is the amount of insulin I need. I mean, that took many steps back to be like, I need less and reassessment Mm -hmm. than a big amount because it never would drop that low until I stopped eating those carbohydrates. So the type ones really can have some, some can get, can drop real low if they don't. So, but I think it was all for good. This is all in a good way. Um, but yeah, so now, so really because of CrossFit, our diets have really zero sugar. I mean, not that I didn't, I used to eat a lot of sugar, but I'd have a cookie here. You know, and then the, the starches is the big one. I mean, I bread was a normal part of my life and pasta is an Italian and yeah. rice. And I just really don't eat that stuff. I mean, the spaghetti squash pasta is pretty good. Yeah. You know, you when, these... you, when you go home with your family. Well, so yeah, that's when we go to New York is like, yeah. I know instantly when I go to New York, my basal level immediately goes up. Um, <laughs> we just eat a lot more and it's probably more of the wine. You know, my dad's always got he used to make his own wine. And so we're always probably drinking more. <laughs> um, Seven calories per ounce. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. I know. Well, and the, the, yeah, there's that grape component to it that like jacks the sugar up. Uh-huh. But great. yeah, yeah. That's great. Um, I want to, um, start wrapping up and there's three questions I ask everyone at the end of the podcast, but before I do that, any advice that you would give someone listening who, or a family member who has type one diabetes, who's starting CrossFit, thinking about starting CrossFit, um, anything you wish you would have known earlier on? Started yesterday, you know, (laughs) it's uh, definitely helpful, but absolutely starting CrossFit has to come with a compensatory check more, increase your checking. Most type ones nowadays have CGM. So that makes it a little bit easier, the Mm -hmm. continuous glucose monitor. I wish I was able to handle that. I I can, so I'm sure that would make it a little bit easier. Um, But yeah, it's really just about checking and understanding and constantly reassessing what your ratios are. So just a little thing, most type one diabetics, like people who aren't type one diabetics don't understand. Sometimes they say, well, how much insulin do you take per day? I go, well, it depends on what I eat. And they're like, well, how much is that? I'm like, well, I take one unit per 15 grams of carbohydrates. And they, that still doesn't make sense to them, but I'm like, so it's a range. I mean, meals, it can be between two and seven units, you know, um, of short acting or depending if I have a snack or if I go out, you know, it's, it's just, you know, I can't, I can't give you anything better more specific than that. Um, that sometimes can change. So 
depending on where you're at. There was a really good article. I, I when I was having these frequent hypoglycemias, I did all this searching through all CrossFitters who were type one. There's a bunch of good stuff out there. There's a young guy uh, who got type one diabetes when he was, I think, recovering from addiction in CrossFit in in Ireland or in Scotland. There was a good article about him. Um, that was a really good one. There was one that was linked to the diabetes um, CrossFit article from a uh, couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It wasn't in that article. It was linked to it, but there was a young lady who I think was a financial analyst who was type one diabetic. And she gave a couple of things in there about how her body reacts to certain types of workouts and kind of breaks them up. And I was like, I never even was able to see this pattern, but now that she puts it that way, that was really good. So just read, do a lot of reading on, there's a lot of us out there, type one diabetes. We should probably come up with our own little cross, <laughs> you know, it's a group or something. And you said, so just for people listening, you know, it sounds like things got harder for a while when you started CrossFit, when you made your diet, when you right. made changes to your diet, but in the end, despite that, you still think it's worth it. And you still are now seeing overall benefits. What are the biggest benefits that you've seen? Uh, just how I feel sleep mm -hmm. patterns are better. Mm -hmm. My mental, mental attitude is night better. Um, uh, it's great to see it bleed out onto my relationships and my family and my kids are doing it. We started a CrossFit kids program at our gym. Okay. Um, it's just getting pe people to see like my parents was nice. They haven't quite gotten into it yet, but they've said, I've never seen every time I see you, like my wife and I, every time I see you two, you look healthier. You just look better. Mm -hmm. um, everything from this, just skin complexion and, uh, you know, getting sick and right all sorts of stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just, you can just feel it's hard to put, put a finger on it. Um, you know, my A1Cs have gotten better, but I, I, so in the beginning, I wonder if they got too good for a little bit, you know, they dropped down to anything, any A1C for me, less than seven, Mm -hmm. which for type twos would, they would think that's astronomically high, but for type one and me 6.6 .6 and 6.4, which mm -hmm. they even got down to 6.2. That was probably just, it mm -hmm. just comes to, I was too frequently hypoglycemic for that. But, um, so I don't want to say my numbers got better because they did, but that might have, they've kind of come back up a little bit, which is, but all the other stuff is good too. I mean, it just, I mean, you just feel better. You can see your progress and you can you constantly get better at stuff. That CrossFit health video from a couple of days ago about, the lady picking up her deadlift and then picking up her doing yeah. the farmer's carry walk and yeah. doing the burpee down on the table. It was like, it was the okay. greatest. Oh, wow. That's great. And it sounds like your overall insulin um, need decrease, which you said, obviously financially that's helpful, but also just for your general health long-term is probably good. Yeah. Right. And I'm sure some people that could be way more impactful if they don't have good insurance. So if they're paying, you know, a hundred dollars for like NPH insulin, which is like the worst and oldest type of insulin. Right. I mean, they may find that like their decrease and if they have to that, that could be a, quite a financial. That was the, I almost got my dad to start coming to the CrossFit gym in New York. We go to until then it, cl it closed down during the pandemic. But by telling him that, like he, he had insurance through his retirement, um, mm -hmm. which went away when the okay. uh, Affordable Care Act came in. So he never was able to get the Medicare Part D, which is like the insurance yeah. coverage, the pharmaceutical. So he's been using good RX for everything, but Gosh. he pays cash for his antihypertensives. He's on three of them. <clears throat> I said, I will guarantee you that if you do this for six months, you will be off all of those, maybe one half a pill. Yeah. And he was like, that got him. He was like, hmm, you know, <laughs> but not quite. <laughs> okay. Well, there's still time. So still, still potential. Um, what are the three things that you do now on a regular basis that have the biggest positive impact on your health? Uh, for sure. I mean, number one is CrossFit and I, I'll say CrossFit, the workouts, um, yeah. you know, the CrossFit is so life encompassing. So I can't, that, but that would definitely be probably number one. Yeah. Um, when I was asked to answer this question, I said CrossFit, but I tried to lump everything in so I could use my two other things. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Well, that's a good one. No. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll say CrossFit, the workouts, but the other stuff has to do with CrossFit too. So yeah. definitely number one is exercise. And number two is honestly, I used to be, you know, typical, like when I go to New York, I said, like we pull out the wine and we have wine basically every night and drink, you know, which is probably not a good thing. Right. I, um, I, I stopped doing the, we used to, I used to like come home from work and have a glass of wine before dinner. Not that I was ever getting sloshed, but yeah. you know, a glass of wine every night yeah. when I, when we did the nutrition, that was like the first thing was like, all right. And I, I immediately noticed better sleep patterns. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel better. 
it just, I mean, and then now, and it was, that was years ago. So recently in the last year or so, didn't uh, the WHO or somebody came out, it might've been the CDC that said the, uh, the best amount of alcohol to drink is zero. Like, which was news for me. I was always white knuckling that one little bit of red wine a night is good, but it's like, well, you can get that same benefit from a couple of blueberries. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't need the alcohol. You don't need the wine. If you want that benefit that you're getting from red wine, eat a cup of berries and you'll be just as healthy and more healthy because, and it's so funny. It was like, it was like a, all of a sudden you wake up the idea of alcohol. I work in the emergency department in South Los Angeles. It's a trauma center. Mm-hmm. Everybody, excuse me for, I have to just have to say it the flat out way. Everybody who does dumb sh- does it when they're on alcohol. Like mm-hmm. it just, that's bad decisions. Plus like, it's like my daughter's like, I accidentally hit my head while I was jumping on the bed with one foot and, you know, <laughs> nails on the floor. And I'm like, Mimi, that's not called an accident. That is called an expected outcome. You know, I differentiate it with that with them all the time. Yeah. And it's like, these accidents are so much more prone when you're alcohol. And that's probably why the right amount is zero because alcohol is implicated in so many bad things that, you know, I guess if you could in theory have your glass of wine and, and not have that ability to make bad decisions, which is impossible. Right. Um, so yeah, it's just not number two is definitely, I don't really drink out. I mean, don't get me wrong. We go out for a friend's birthday or we all go out one night. It's like, I haven't seen friends holiday parties. Absolutely. It's not like I'm not a zero alcohol person, but, but just as a regular part of my life, mm-hmm. it's just, you know, that's I have to go out and purchase alcohol when we have friends over for like an event or something because right. we just don't really have it around here. Mm-hmm. That's and then good. the last one. I know. I think a lot of people that I've talked to lately have just noticed, especially with these straight sleep trackers and HRV trackers have just started to notice the impact on sleep. And then it, it just makes you think twice about it. Yeah. That was a huge one, right? Alcohol and heart rate variability. That's like, it immediately impacts that, right? Makes it way, way worse. Yeah. That was another one. I got to get into more of the wearables I hate wearing stuff. I just, I, I but I, I, Not for I think everybody, you know, some people it just causes a lot more anxiety, I think, or stress. Well, there's a new one that's starting human trials on it here. It's like a K watch. It's like, I think it has this type of an adhesive or, or it has these little micro needles on it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a sugar control watch. Okay. So maybe that once, once the wearables have CGM yeah. in there that I'm not allergic to, I'm, I'm sold. Yeah, that's great. All right. Your third thing. All right. Third thing that I do now that positively impacts my life. Um, gotta be getting enough sleep. Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I don't really do anything kind of fun. It's sad. When I tore my quads, I started playing my guitar again. Um, unfortunately, one of our friends at work had an untimely death. I think he had an MI. So I made a painting of him. I was, I haven't done the artwork in a while. So that was like during the pandemic. So I should probably start doing more of that. But what I do is I cut that, I sleep, I mandate, eight to nine hours a night of sleep every night. Cause I work a night shift. So I'm like, if I, I have a great, I've like, I'm in my, we have a gym, the detached office downstairs, which is like my office, but it's really like my post shift and sleeping area. And it's got all our stuff in it. It's, I'm sitting on my, um, my, uh, my ski erg. <laughs> We're sitting right on my ski erg machine, but, um, yeah. So getting enough sleep for sure. I probably should do more fun stuff, but I'm not a person that'll sit up and watch TV. I, I mean, I think it's, I, I don't mind watching movies. I'll, I'll set up and watch movies. Cause I think that's an art form. Now, unfortunately, some of the new series you can binge watch. It's a bit of an art form, but like just watching mindless TV is just not something I was never really into. So I just kind of like made sure I absolutely get enough sleep to, I think it's super important to just be able to keep going, you know, <laughs> God, so much stuff. the shift work and the night shift and all that stuff. Now you might've gone to this already, but the next question is what is one thing that you think would have a big impact on your health, but you have a hard time implementing it or something you're working on? That's a good one. There's a couple of them. Um, wearables was one of them. So I have a couple of things on my to-do list, nothing pressing, but, but one of these days I'm going to get into them. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all those like kind of modern biohacks. Those mm-hmm. guys up in Silicon Valley all seem to love them. My friend tells me all about them, like mm-hmm. ice bath. Definitely yeah. want to get into that. I haven't done it. Yeah. Um, wearables. I really think I would get some good information from them. Um, intermittent fasting. Mm-hmm. I'd love to give it a try. Mm-hmm. Um, and my friend does it in San Francisco and he's, he loves it. Um, I just, 
can't not eat. I just love, I just eat <laughs> love food. all the time. And now I'm trying that I'm not working out so hard because my, 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 my like uh, rehabbing, yeah. I'm really trying to cut down the amount of calories I eat. I eat good quality food, but I mean, I was eating like 5,000 calories a day when I was doing the HWPO and I just, yeah. it all gained, I gained muscle. I gained like almost eight pounds of muscle during the program, but I have to, now that I'm not utilizing them, I have to kind of cut that down, but yeah, intermittent fasting is one of them. Those are probably the, a couple. I hope that's okay. I gave you more than one. I love this. Yeah. Last question is what does a healthy life look like to you? Uh, it starts with attitude. Number one, mm. you know, mm-hmm. glass is half full, walk in with a smile, give everybody the opportunity to return your smile. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you definitely got 90% of it. Uh, what I tell these, so I tell people in the ER is 90% of the battle is nutrition. And a lot of people struggle with it. And I try and tell people, don't worry about the quantity at a, really at all for the first couple of years mm-hmm. until like the, you know, mechanics, consistency, intensity, like mm-hmm. the mechanics of it are the quality, like make, just do your best. And, and I think the quantity usually sometimes it works itself out, whether people are on a budget, right? My, all my patients live in a food desert. South Los Angeles has almost zero areas to get fresh quality food. Not to say you can't make healthy choices. Even if you have to live at McDonald's, you can still make healthy choices if you, if you want to. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to not make those healthy choices. But mm-hmm. I think if you make those healthy choices in time, you will, the quantity will work, it, work itself out. So his nutrition is kind of the main, mm-hmm. one of the main things. And then the other stuff kind of falls into it. You're, so attitude is probably starting, but you have to have that attitude to be able to want to make them change in the nutrition. And then the other stuff is, you know, sleep, exercise. You can't change your genetics yet. <laughs> those are probably the other little factors. All those good things. I love it. Awesome. Well, this was so great, Luke. Thanks for your positive attitude and your energy and sharing all of your wisdom um, throughout, you know, your own personal experience and with CrossFit and in your career as an ER doctor. And thanks for, for leading the charge. I know we didn't even get too much into today, you know, the healthcare system and bigger picture questions, but we, I know we've talked about that personally before and yeah. uh, the shared passion of ours. So thank you from sort of leading from the front lines as well. Well, thanks. So thanks. Stay tuned. We're going to try and get into some, uh, my friend and I are going to try and open up a kind of a PT on steroids program. It's not necessarily going to be direct primary care, but it's going to, you know, more from the CrossFit side is going to get the old folks in there and, you know, small group, small group. And, you know, that, that, that's the, yeah, that's the future of healthcare is I think what you guys are doing precision health. And that's just, you know, 90%, 90% of his nutrition, 4% of it, 5% of his exercise, you know, they've got like two to 3% is medicine and surgery and, but 95% of it, you don't need a physician for, I think our training is probably the best to do anything involving health, but I'm, you know, we're not going to call this a doctor's office and we're not even going to call it. You can go have your doctor's office for when you need your screening colonoscopy or whatever, but the future of medicine is going to be here in the box. We can check your blood pressure. We can check your blood sugar. We can check your waist circumference every visit. And we'll log all these things in just as we log your friend time. It's going to be you know, what, what your, uh, random blood sugar is and what your blood pressure is each day. And, and then you don't need to, you don't need a physician, hopefully or malpractice insurance, right? (laughs) (laughs) That's That's the idea. That's amazing. Well, I can't wait to see where that goes and, um, hopefully we'll catch on and and we'll see it everywhere. Awesome. Thanks Luke. Thank you for having me, Julie. This is an honor. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you or someone you know has a story to share on a future episode of Pursuing Health, please write me at info at pursuing-health.com. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please also consider subscribing and giving it a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does help to get the word out to more people. 